Welcome uh, everyone to this latest session of the UK Trade and Business Commission. Uh, today we're going to be digging into what is happening within travel. That's our first session uh, from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock. And then we're going to move straight on to music. Um, there are some similarities between uh, travel and music, I think it's fair to say. Both of them are very difficult to deal with in a trade deal. And I think we have found the, um, the straight jacket of the current trade deal that we've got really quite problematic within music, which is a sector that I work in. But first, we're going to kick off with travel. So absolutely fantastic to have Simon, Luke, John and Nigel with us all giving evidence this morning. Um, we do keep to very tight time here. So without further ado, uh, can we go to the first question, uh, which is, well, I think we've all been reading the newspapers. We all know what or we think we know what is going on. Uh, and it may not be the correct understanding. Um, so the first question is, there have been multiple reports of persistent disruption in the travel industry. Um, could you give us an overview of this? and what is really going on. So um, if I could go to Simon first, that would be great. Uh, oh, no, it looks as if Simon may have frozen. Simon, are you back? Yes. Can't quite hear you. Um, perhaps so we can go to Luke uh, whilst uh, Simon um, and sorts out the IT. So look, can we go to you now? Yeah, absolutely. Firstly, thank you very much for uh, inviting us this morning. Uh, yes, we have, since the restart of international travel in March, seen uh, some problems around uh, delays, cancellations and logistical challenges uh, related to uh, services at airports. Uh, I think it's important to put some of that into context. So the most serious form of disruption is cancellations. Uh, they're running on average of between three and four percent um, but the vast majority of people are getting away on their holidays without significant challenges. So I think it's important to say that firstly. Uh, but of course, we do understand that this um, disruption is causing significant distress and disappointment to those that are caught up in it. Um, it is primarily due to a shortage of workers. Of course, that's not unique to the UK travel industry. We're seeing that across the wider economy as well. But I think there are a number of factors that have made that a worse situation for the travel industry than perhaps elsewhere. I mean, firstly, it is COVID. You know, we've gone through two years of the worst crisis the travel industry has ever seen. Uh, we were first into this crisis. We were last out of this crisis. We're one of the only economic sectors across the UK economy that never had a period without restrictions on trade across the entirety of the two year period. And uniquely, we had six months from September 21, where we had no salary support whatsoever in place. Um, and the industry is still very, very severely restricted um, in terms of what, how we could operate. And of course, restrictions got worse actually in the end of 21 uh, and the government ignored calls for tailored support for the travel industry. So I think that that played a very large part in where we ended up in terms of employment. In our part of the sector, we're mainly intermediary businesses, tour operators, travel, uh, travel agents, travel management companies that APTA represents. We lost very nearly half of all staff that were in the industry in March 2020, 49% in a survey that we did in November 21. That climbed back up to 78% uh, by April 22 in our part of the sector, but clearly still dragging well behind, uh, well behind 2020 levels. I think the other factors to take into account, there was very minimal notice given to the industry that restart was coming, uh, only a, a matter of a few days really, uh, that all restrictions would be lifted. So that left us at a bit of a standing start. And then, of course, for some of those operational roles at airports, and I think this is a critical factor, they are security sensitive roles. So you do have to get vetting, you do have to get security checks in order to take on those positions, and that delays the onboarding of staff. Um, so I'll leave it there for now. I'm sure some of my fellow panelists will add some, some further colour, but I think that that is primarily why we are where we are. Thank you very much, Luke. Um, Simon, your thoughts? Yes. Uh, yes, forgive me. I um, everything was all nicely set up, and then at ten o'clock exactly everything collapsed. So uh, my apologies. I hope that you are now 
remembering me correctly. Um, it, now, forgive me, um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed what Luke had to say, but I'm afraid your question uh, Chair was um, slightly staticky, and therefore um, I, I can give you all my thoughts. But um, if you if you can um, uh, prime me with, a, with with the question you would like immediately uh, uh, answered, I, I should be delighted. It's basically what is going on in the travel industry. Um, is it the yes. pandemic, or is it Brexit, or a combination of the two? Yes, fine, fine, fine. So, so effectively addressing the whole um, uh, the, the the whole business of the uh, uh, the the session. Yes, well, um, COVID clearly camouflaged an awful lot of Brexit, and I think it's very important to separate out what the uh, effects were. Now, COVID obviously. Uh, as we heard from Luke, crushed the travel industry and made the restart very, very difficult. We are seeing in the enormous stresses that are taking place this weekend, today, um, that uh, there is a, a huge problem with the supply side of the travel industry. Just in the past couple of hours, um, I've been reporting on Amsterdam Airport, which obviously has not been affected by Brexit, um, uh, sending messages saying do not try and travel with any checked baggage. Um, and also we are seeing fares soaring uh, for the getaway weekend. If you want to go to um, Faro in beautiful Portugal, then British Airways will take you there, but only for £705 one way. So huge uh, uh, undersupply. But the Brexit impact on the travel industry has been absolutely be massive, which goes way beyond the uh, the, the, the COVID impact. Um, now, I would begin, of course, by the problem that uh, so much of the outbound and inbound tourism industry was staffed by people from uh, the European Union. Many of them went home during COVID and have not returned because, of course, the paperwork is much more difficult. And you can talk to anyone from hoteliers in Scotland to um, the ground handlers at the UK's airports, and they will say something to the effect of, yes, somewhere between 25 and 50% of our staff were EU workers. We've still got some, but actually the, uh, the labor pool is much smaller than it used to be. And of course, from the point of view of the traveler, my goodness, it has been so much more difficult to travel, partly because the travel industry, and I'm afraid I'm looking at you here, Luke, um, not not ABTA directly, but um, some of your members um, are have been um, transmitting completely inaccurate advice about passport validity after Brexit, helped and in fact I think originally fueled by the government, which showed astonishing um, refusal until the twenty second of May this year to accept what Europe's rules on British passport holders going to Europe actually were. I have genuinely never seen anything like it. And for me to be going around and talking to the individual airlines and tour operators and the UK government saying, here's the rules. I've, I've asked Brussels, here's all my sources to check. You know, you want to check direct with them, but these are the rules. So please, will you enforce them? Um, it is uh, an extraordinary situation um, which has made things only worse as far as I can see. Sorry to be so miserable as well as so badly connected this morning. Right. OK, um, we're very tight on time, but I'd love to hear a bit more perhaps later on in relation to what the government was saying, which wasn't quite right by the sounds of things. But I'm actually now going to hand over to uh, the next commissioner, Andrew, with his question. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to each of the witnesses as well. Um, so turning to the question, all of us are aware of the problems you know, due to a lack of staff. Um, my question is, are the UK airports and airlines experience a special problems as a result of this. John, maybe. Hi, good, good, good morning, everyone. Um, yes, we are experiencing uh, problems. I, I think one of the greatest problems we experienced through the COVID pandemic, uh, much to our massive frustration, was that everyone talked about airlines and airports. Um, the UK, UK aviation industry 
is a perfect triangle of airlines, airports, and aviation services businesses. But as we weren't sexy, we didn't have a big brand, we're a B2B business, nobody talked to us or listened to us. And we had a, the devil's own job just trying to get on a committee to talk to the government. Um, I think we had one audience with Grant Shapps um, where we told them quite clearly that you must treat aviation as a, a separate case. We are going to lose 45% of our workforce that we will need in six months time. Um, and that is what, what has happened. Um, from my point of view, Brexit is an issue, but Brexit isn't the root cause. Brexit has made the issue worse in the UK, but it's not the root cause. Um, we operate in 35 countries across the world and we have you know, big issues in Amsterdam. We have big issues in the United States and Toronto and Canada. Um, so you know, there is an issue, but it, it is all to do uh, to an extent with, with, with the pricing. And um, our, our job as an aviation support services business um, is, you know, we, we keep the wheels turning at an airport. So what a, a lot of people didn't realize is that the UK operate a, a largely outsourced model. So with the exception of, say, British Airways at Terminal 5, who are fully insourced, everything that happens at an airport is, is largely outsourced. So if you go to Edinburgh Airport, for example, and you see everybody in a British Airways uniform, they actually work for Menzies. Okay, so, but we're, we're a 5% margin business um, and, and you don't need very much to go wrong or to put extra staff on for that 5% to disappear very quickly. Um, so I, I think there is a, an issue with the, the whole supply chain and, 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 and how that's, that's financed and, that, and that, that is how much the airlines pay their handlers. We're, we're about 7 or 8% of the cost of a flight but we're probably 80 or 90% of what can go wrong on the ground. So, so we need to operate efficiently for the airline to operate efficiently, but also for the airport to operate efficiently. So, so airports have a role to play in this as well, because you know, if you look coming out of the pandemic, um, airlines have a way to recover costs by putting uh, the, the cost of a flight up, as, as Simon has just said. Airports have a way of recovering costs. You know, we, we've experienced with airports, they've put the cost of staff car parking up they put the cost of our baggage rooms up. You know, we don't have, we're in three and five year contracts with airlines, so we don't have that ability. So what we need to do and what we need to do is work together as an industry and we need to, to, to make a job working at the airport attractive again. It used to be quite attractive. It used to be, you know, we had huge amounts of people who had been there all their life, but we have to accept that the world has changed now. Um, you know. I just need to look at the number of Amazon vans that, that come up my driveway that my wife has clicked on and, and bought something. Um, you know, there are alternative jobs for people now driving Amazon vans, uh, Tesco, Sainsbury food deliveries. And we're now fishing in the same pool where we never used to fish in the same pool. Um, we're, we're closer to a minimum wage job than we've ever been. And when you're asking people to start at five o'clock in the morning in either very hot weather or very cold weather and, 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 and move bags onto an aircraft or move cargo onto an aircraft or um, uh, do various things, that has to be an attractive pay rate. So um, that, that, that's something that needs to change. Also, um, to turn on ourselves, I, I think the handlers need to look at themselves as well because we, we, we cut our own throat sometimes as well. And there's always somebody goes and gives an airline a price which, which we think it's maybe crazy. So the, the handlers need to organize themselves better. Um, you know, and if I say criticize us through um, COVID, um, the AOA did a great job for airports and Airlines for UK did a great job for, for airlines, but we didn't have a handling body that could, um, that could you know, make our voice heard. So there, there's been some lessons for us as well. And we're a long way from perfect uh, also. But, um, that, I guess, would be my, my key point. Thank you very much. Um, Luke, anything that you want to add? Um, well, I mean, clearly, as I said in my opening answer, yes, there, there are specific issues for kind of airlines and airports and why it impacts them. I think that it isn't only an issue for that part of the sector, though, to pick on John's point about the message to Grant Chaps about travel being a wider ecosystem. Actually, the intermediaries in the industry had a similar challenge, uh, initially at least. Um, I mean, we were around the table in many of the, the, the discussions eventually, but actually some of the 
um, structures of government, I think, do need to be looked at to ensure that the wider ecosystem is heard as well. Most uh, or many of the tickets distributed in the UK are done through tour operators and travel agents, and we weren't always part of that discussion. Um, and as I said, we lost 49% of, of the industry staff during the crisis. So it certainly isn't only airport and airline roles that have been affected. We've also seen a loss of travel consultants, tour operation, operational staff, um, customer service staff, of course, and we've seen that playing through in a number of the issues that Simon perhaps uh, alluded to in his, in his answer. So I think it is a wider piece that he's looking at. Thank you. And Simon? I think you're on mute, actually. Thank you. Um, I guess, as John was saying, it's uh, very, very much about expertise. Now, any industry absolutely thrives on getting new blood in, of course. But the thing is about aviation, you do actually want those people who've been there 20, 30 years, who have seen every possible combination of circumstances and know how to deal with it, who know that when the passenger is a no-show at the gate, exactly where that bag is and to retrieve it so that the aircraft can depart. And without that level of expertise, um, things are going to be very, very rocky, I fear, right through the summer. Thank you. Nigel, I don't know, welcome, I don't know if you heard the question or not, but it's about, um, you know, all of us are aware that their problems as a result of a lack of staff are the UK airports and airlines experiencing special problems as a result of this, maybe a quick sort of answer, of a minute or two, as we're, we're yeah. tight on. Yeah, no, sure. No, sorry, my many apologies uh, for being late, but um, yeah, no, so we are, yeah, the industry, the sector is, uh, it, there is a there is a disconnect between um, the number the staffing levels we've got this summer and uh, what we need. Um, it's for me it's a question of of the speed with which the recovery is happening, passenger numbers, and um, that you know we can have the argument about should we have known it was coming and um, you know, who was to blame for that? Not really very helpful. Um, the, the 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 truth is is that where we are in July 2022 we have. Yeah, more passengers than we have staff to cope with and that I don't think that is a I don't think uh, that's a long-term 2024 problem I do worry about the next 12 months and I think there's a lot that needs to be done over the next 12 months to, to make sure that summer 2023 doesn't face the same problems that we're facing this summer. Thank you very much all I'll pass you back to the chair Tamara I think is next. Yeah. Um, yeah. Over to you Tamara. Thank you. Hi. Um, so my question is, what proportion of UK travel industry staff originate from the EU and how much of a problem is that in the future uh, um, for staffing if they will either have to be found in the UK or visas arranged? And are there the appropriate visa categories already in play? And I will start with Luke, please. Uh, yeah, well, thank you for the question. Um, we do commission research regularly on the travel and tourism labour market in the UK. I'm more than happy to share that with the commission after uh, the hearing. We last did that in 2019. Mm. At that point, on average, across the travel and tourism industry, it's 9% of all workers that were EU nationals, 13% non-UK uh, non nationals, but 9% of those, 9% uh, of total EU workers. Uh, now that varies a bit between the three sectors, so inbound it's about 11%, outbound about 8% and domestic about 8% as well. But clearly within individual businesses and individual sectors within the travel and tourism industry, there are a number that have far higher levels of workers. So hotels, for example, uh, many of those would say that over half of their staff are EU nationals, for example. So that's the average kind of um, across the board. In terms of the visas point, uh, clearly the industry did ask for um, for aviation critical roles to be added onto the shortage occupation list, the government wasn't willing to do that. So I think we would say that there are visa routes that could be explored uh, that would help to alleviate some of the immediate challenges we're facing. But for our part of the sector, actually, the intermediary part of the sector, tour operators in particular, this is about labour mobility generally. And it's actually the ability to move staff in both directions between the UK and the EU that's a big problem. So we're seeing very significant operational challenges putting on trips to Europe. Uh, both from drivers, travel reps, other staff, because of the 90 and 180 day limit in terms of how long you can be in Europe. And of course, that includes your personal trips um, and also the end of mutual recognition of professional qualifications, which is another barrier. So 
I think there are uh, problems beyond visas, to be honest. Thank you. Um, I'll now hand that quest same question to John, please. Hi, Tamara. Yeah, for us, the numbers are a bit higher. We probably on the, the you know, the different lines of our business on, on the baggage handling line, we were probably up near 30 percent EU uh, in, in employers. We, we, it's more, more physical labour, um, front of house and check in maybe a bit less and cargo mm. handling a bit less. Mm. Um, yeah, we, we, we're seeing that as a significant issue. Um, we would love for um, aviation to be on the, you know, the shortage occupations list. I, I really don't understand why we're not. Um, and, and freedom of movement would help. We're, we're now in a stage where we, we're pretty much fully staffed now, but we have a skills shortage and we have a, a supervision shortage. Uh, we're in the position where we could bring people in from from uh, Spain, from Mexico, from Eastern Europe to, to help out with the problem, but we just can't do that because it's, it, it's too, too too long and too, too painful. So. Um, it, it would be great if, if we could have the, the freer movement of individuals. Um, so the desire and, is there for staff, but the, the barriers are due to the to the um, visa restrictions. Correct. Right. Thank you. Um, Nigel from Heathrow Airport, please. Yeah, uh, thanks, Laura. Um, so about 10 percent of our direct uh, employer employees, our colleagues are from the EU today. So that's about uh, just over 500 of the 5000 people at Heathrow that um, Heathrow directly employ. I don't have numbers and we don't have numbers for the total number of the 50,000 plus um, that are. But I would think that our 10 percent is probably uh, a fair reflection across across the whole kind of campus. Um, so in terms of um, kind of issues, um, the, 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 point, the points application system is still um, overly complex uh, in our view. Um, visas are still expensive and can be cost prohibitive for um, both for sponsorship and, um, and, for, the, and for the costs themselves. Um, the, uh, but most importantly, the, the, the issue I'd, like, I'd most like to uh, Kind of flag to the committee is the is that the visa categories the current visa categories don't allow for some of the critical roles at the airport um these roles you know such as security officers baggage handling they're not viewed as being um skilled um, but they do require um extensive training they do require um people uh to you know they are they are key links in the chain and um they those are also the roles um that looking across the industry at the moment are um are, you know are the ones that are most under resourced and therefore leading to um you know the the the, the type of uh, caps and capacity constraints that we're seeing across uk and indeed eu and indeed eu airports so it's it, it's interesting because european airports are having the similar problem but we'll, we'll come on to that in a minute but it's so it, it's 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 not a you know it's difficult to nail it down and say oh it's a brexit problem but there what we're certainly seeing in the uk is that we do not have uh, enough people uh, available in a pool to fill the vacancies there are um, at the airport at the moment. So whereas there's a squeeze that I would agree is across across many countries, not just the UK, what you're seeing is what your concern is, is that in the longer term, it will be the UK that will be more. Adversity. Exactly. I think our a competitive position is um, we, we are. But, you know, when you when we look, when I talk to some of my colleagues from European airports and look at some of the solutions that they are are in, in but those are not available to us uh, post Brexit. Brilliant. And I know that Simon has dipped in and out, who I was just going to ask that question to, but I, I can't see him on the call. He's, he's come on and off twice, so he's obviously having Wi-Fi issues, so I'm going to go back to the chair and maybe we can pick up with him in notes after this session. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tamara. Um, can we move on to Jeff? Thank you very much, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, for those of us who I'm afraid do not have a complete view of your sector and industry because of my background. It's been really interesting that there's been a lot of suggestion that the entire travel industry model of low costs and margins can't be sustained. And part of that is because of staff shortages. I'd be really interested to know how true you think that is. Is this a fundamental change in your industry? And Nigel, can I start with you if you don't mind? You uh, sorry to have myself on the other there. Yes, no, please do, do something. Yeah, no, it's a really, it's a really good question, Jeff. Um, and it's a, it's a good flag because I think that, I think this the 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 kind of the structural 
uh, issues we are seeing in the industry are, yes, we can argue these are um, unique set of unprecedented, all those kind of adjectives we hear all the time about what's going on in the world at the moment. But um, so, yep, accept all that. But what it is showing us, though, is that um, there were in the travel industry, as I think in many other sectors, there were a lot of how to, how to phrase this correctly, but kind of hidden or under the radar our roles that previously weren't you know were, wasn't a lot of light shot on them but are absolutely key to the whole process working so everyone knows about pilots and air traffic controllers but do but you know but if that's great can have all of it, but if you haven't got someone who can load and unload the uh, the, the plane or fuel the plane then the plane you have as many pilots you like as many air traffic controllers you like you're, you're not going to planes aren't going to take off so i think that and those roles were traditionally, you know, poor pay. We have at Heathrow been uh, have, have a campaign for the last few years working with our trade unions about London living wage that we pay for our direct in, direct uh, direct employees. But and we've introduced that into contracts for our direct supply chain. But we are still finding issues with um, others. There's 400 different companies work work at Heathrow who have operation at Heathrow, and we are those that we don't have a direct contract relationship with. We are finding it difficult to encourage them to do things like London living wage terms and conditions to improve the pay conditions. And so I think that you know, and the, the pushback is well because that will push up costs. Um, that will you know will become uncompetitive. Um, if we look at airline ground handlers, which is the big issue at UK airports at the moment, which are the the contract that airlines have with other companies to do things like cleaning the aircraft, catering the aircraft, um, putting the baggage on and off. Those are definitely contracts that have been a race to the bottom, um, where they're incredibly competitive and it is based often based on cost rather than service. And I think that we need to look again at that kind of structure and say actually there is a the you know it is short term maybe in the cost reduced but long term if you're having the kind of disruption we're seeing at airport at the moment then that isn't that isn't actually saving money so um so i think that there is we need to look at you know paying every person in the aviation uh chain pay them pay, they need to be paid a decent wage and the consequence of that is that the end cost to the consumer um, may may have to go up and i think that is a reality that the industry needs to face up to John, would you like to pick up one or two of the threads on that, please? Uh, yes, I, I will, and I, I agree with everything Nigel, Nigel said. Um, I, I, I think there has to be you know, more value put into the chain, for sure. Um, and you know, if I give you an example, you know, we may turn around a, a Boeing 737, um, you know, and it, it can, the, the cost of that can wildly differ depending on what services you're doing but if you say on a standard basis for for 500 pounds and we're a five percent margin business you can work out how much our net profit is in that flight okay so it's 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 not very much um we, we need to put more more value into that but I, I think the way the airlines procure um is that, as i said earlier we're seven or eight percent of the cost of a flight but we're 80 or 90 percent of what can go wrong as, as nigel quite rightly says and we, we've got highly skilled staff putting heavy machinery within two centimeters of an aircraft, loading an aircraft. Uh, I, I think the industry needs to work together, though, to have more standardization. And, and to be fair to Heathrow, they, they are trying to do this. You know, if we've got the exact same aircraft, a Boeing 737, um, you know, we operate you know, over a million turnarounds a year um, in, in 35 countries. We know how to load a 737 aircraft. Uh, six different airlines at Heathrow with the exact same aircraft will ask us to load it differently. So therefore, you have to train staff six different ways. Staff then have to remember to do that. You know, it, it's if we can bring more standardisation into the industry, that will increase safety. It will increase standardisation. It will increase productivity. So we need to get the airlines to come to the party and do that. And we're trying very hard to do that through uh, through IATA and working with airports. You know, somebody like Heathrow can. Can implement a standard, uh, what we call an IGOM, that, that would be fantastic. Um, but airlines don't don't like that. Um, so standardisation will help. But um, yeah, you know, the world has changed, and and, and we're we're fishing in a different pool now, and we have to look at that. But but I but I also think we as a as a, an industry need to educate people because an airline will will buy on cost. And Nigel's right. There's been a race to the bottom. But it shouldn't just be about how much they pay us for the turnaround because there's a whole lot of dots that need to be joined up if that aircraft's late there might be an eu 261 fine if we damage the aircraft that that can be hugely costly 
um, that there's reputational damage from the, the bags not arriving, the bags, you know, the, there's all these things that must be joined up. And therefore, what they pay for the turnarounds shouldn't be the most important thing. If you can pay more for that, have more experienced staff, have a better service, the actual cost of the airline will go down. And I guess that's my challenge and my peers' challenge at Swiss Sport and all the other companies to try and make airlines see that. But I, I, I do think at the end of the day, we are, we are victims of the, of the stock market and, and whatever, and people and chief executives are under huge pressure to deliver profits. Um, and it's very difficult to tell somebody they need to, to, to take a leap of faith that that will increase their profits when they can just see a spreadsheet that says that that cell tells me I've cut my cost by X percent. No, no, I, I fully understand. And, and from my side of things, as somebody who works partially in the process industries where it's all about safety and standardization and margins and costs, I, I think there's some really interesting conversations in there. But we're trying to talk about staff shortages and costs. And what I'm actually hearing, and Simon, if I could just come to you, if I may, the, the question for me as a consumer is a simple one. How much has Brexit or how much will Brexit continue to add to the cost base when I travel, apart from in staff? That's the conversation I'd be interested in as well. Can you give us any feel for that at all? Simon. Sorry. I think it's true to say that, uh, sorry about my connection problems, um, and I hope this is going to hold up. Um, yeah, uh, so... so certainly from the point of view of, who, of someone who actually started working in the 1970s in aviation there has been since that time a race to the the bottom in terms of reducing cost which has been hugely to the benefit of the traveler now clearly the traveler is now in an extraordinary position where they do not have confidence in travel and that is something that the industry crucially has to address um, I think the passenger will be prepared to pay more in, in, you know, if they can, if that is going to secure a more reliable service. But ultimately, of course, yeah, due to Brexit, it means that the costs are going to be disproportionately high because the labour pool is uh, much lower than it was um, up until uh, 2020. So there will be an effect, but I mean, what the passenger really wants, they don't mind what nationality the people uh, handling their bags are. They just want their bag to arrive and they want to arrive on time and they're gonna have to get used to paying a bit more for it, which I think would be a reasonable bargain. Thanks, Simon. Look, what, what I'm taking from this conversation is the reality is costs are gonna go up full stop and we're gonna have to pay more. Is this a fundamental change in the travel industry from your perspective? And again, I suggest, would you like to just, how much can you talk about the Brexit implications on this? Is that part of the problem or was this coming anyway? Yeah, I don't disagree with uh, anything that the previous panelists have said to me. I think there, there is an issue that needs to be looked at here, but it is likely that the immediate recruitment crunch, as Nigel said in his previous answer, is likely to be relatively temporary certainly out of the system within sort of 18 months to two years. So that may limit some of the kind of longer term structural changes across the industry to a degree. And what we have also seen coming out of COVID is a remarkably resilient appetite for travel. You know, part of the reason we're having this discussion is because people did want to travel again in very, very large numbers very, very quickly. And I think that that is a good sign actually for the future of the industry. Uh, and to Simon's point about people maybe being willing to pay a tiny bit more. In terms of Brexit impacts, um, in addition to uh, those that we've already covered, I think there are a couple of um, challenges for tour operators and the intermediary part of the industry that need to be considered as well, that will have, or certainly risk increasing cost pressures on the industry. And ultimately that feeds through to consumers, as Simon said, in prices. Um, that is around that operational ability to move your staff into Europe. You know, at the moment, taking the example of coach drivers, uh, um, we speak to our coach operators, they say that Typically, their staff will spend upwards of 200 days a year in the European Union conducting mm -hmm. tours uh, with UK nationals. Now, clearly, if you've got a limit of 90 days and 180 day period, you can be in Europe and that includes your personal trips. That isn't going to work, certainly isn't going to work once the EU introduces automated entry and exit checks, which is meant to be coming down the line either this autumn or early next year. Um, and that is going to create real operational challenges for parts of this sector, not just coach drivers, also travel reps and other roles, as I said. But if you look at the coach driver piece, really their choices are going to be hire more staff, 
take less trips, so take capacity out of the market, which obviously then increases um, costs because there's, there's less supply, or hire EU workers only to fulfill those um, journeys into Europe. And actually, over the longer term, my concern would be that if you look at the trade and cooperation agreement for many parts of the travel industry, the natural outcome is that UK nationals are excluded from many of these roles yeah. going forward and the EU nationals who don't have these limits placed on them um, take their place. Now, as Simon said, that may not matter to, to the end consumer, but it can't be the right answer for, for the UK labour market, I, I would suggest. So I think that um, there are a number of issues here, again, where the government just needs to, to, to step up and start to engage with the industry on, on how we can improve the current situation that we have within the trade and cooperation agreement. Luke, that, thank you very much. Chair, back to you, if I may. Thank you very much. Luke, what you just said is exactly what has happened to the music sector. Musicians now can't compete with EU workers when it comes to many of the gigs in the EU because of that 90 day provision. Yeah, and it's, it's actually an impact directly on the tourism market as well, because one of the key services we do offer is performers in destination and, uh, and they can't and they can't do the role. So. Uh, you know, one of, one of the uh, complaints you are beginning to see from customers is, hold on, all of my performers are no longer uh, yeah. the kind of bands I was used to hearing on my holidays. So it, it is, you know, it is a real operational challenge that businesses are facing. Very, very interesting. Over to you, Andrew. Thanks very much. Um, picking up on the, on the comparative picture, you know, we've touched on this briefly earlier. Um, yeah, I'd be interested in your views as to, you know, to the extent that the travel sort of impact and the disruption of the UK is worse or not as bad as elsewhere, such as um, Dublin or Schiphol, and other than Brexit, are there any other factors that are you know, particularly on point in the UK? Maybe we'll start with Simon. Excuse me. <coughs> Simon, I think you're on mute again. Uh, yeah, um, my technology is not helping and I apologise once again. Uh, Nigel will have plenty to say about this, um, but uh, my view on where the problems are, are uh, Amsterdam, uh, Germany in particular, Frankfurt, and um, interestingly, uh, it is, it may be anecdotal, but who knows, uh, but uh, apparently the hotels in Frankfurt around the airport are full of Turkish baggage handlers who have been um, uh, brought in by the Frankfurt Airport Authority from Istanbul in all, uh, huge, um, huge wages to uh, get through the summer, which looks like a, a, an interesting resourcing solution. Uh, Dublin has had some serious problems in terms particularly of the security queues. Um, and so, yes, there are problems elsewhere. I suggest that the UK is having more problems than anywhere else in Europe for two reasons. The first one is that we had the most draconian, expensive, onerous COVID restrictions. So therefore the aviation industry was crushed further. And we have had a bounce back, which is much faster, um, partly, and that, that's all sorts of factors, um, to do with our natural predilection for traveling to, um, well, I was going to say warmer places, but you know what I mean, um, and also uh, that, that, you know, that the fact that we have to fly to get to um, most of our favorite destinations, where Germans, Dutch, uh, Austrians can just get into the car and, um, and head south. So the UK, I think, is a stand alone. And of course, we can just uh, see how much of that is an effect on the dial of, um, of, of Brexit and the employment challenges that that has brought. Nigel, I'm sure you have a lot to add, yeah? Yeah, um, no, thank you. I, mean, I totally agree with the context that Simon has just set out. Um, it is um, you know, the UK's, the uh, aviation industry's, uh, De decline um, numbers during the pandemic were um, lower than they were uh, in Europe, and our numbers are now higher than they are in Europe. So that um, that that speed of that recovery is as 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 you know, as I said, has has we haven't been able to keep pace with that. Uh, and one of the reasons why I'd say also is our and I did building on that about the. The, the, the start we had, if you look at where the UK industry was in March before the international travel uh, rules were um, liberalised and, and, and the restrictions were removed, was that um, the UK industry had received a lot less 
uh, specific sectoral support than uh, than other European countries. The government uh, claims to have given billions of pounds to the uh, to, to the to the aviation industry, actually gave billions of pounds to the aerospace injury, um, in, in industry, um, rather than the rather than the uh, rather than the actual kind of civil aviation. So airports and airlines, compared to their European competitors, we got very very little, which therefore meant that we had to cut back much more. Um, furlough ended in September. Um, international travel didn't resume again until March. So. Um, while furlough was very, very useful to ourselves as the airport and, and to ground handlers and indeed to the airlines to keep um, uh, employees kind of to keep them warm, for one of a better kind of ex one of the expression, when furlough ended in September, there was no resumption of international travel. So there was no way, yeah, there were there weren't jobs for for these people. So we lost a lot of people who we had kept on furlough uh, throughout you know uh, the year and a half that was in place. But it comes September. Um, we lost. So therefore, again, whereas the support that was being given to uh, European aid industry kept going until the until the rules were reversed, not until the domestic rules were reversed, which was the case that happened in the UK. So I think that added to the points that Simon raised, that for me is the reason why we are seeing uh, greater challenges at UK airports than we're seeing at European airports. Thank you. Um, Luke? Uh, well, I agree fully with what Nigel's just said, to be completely honest. It is the lack of financial support that was given, not just to airlines and airports, but to the whole travel industry ecosystem across the UK, uh, which is why we suffered uh, greater numbers of job losses and were unable to retain staff, particularly during that six month gap where we didn't have furlough or any kind of salary support. And we still had very, very heavy restrictions on international travel. I mean, to give a bit of context to that, going into November, our members were trading at no more than a third of where they would usually be trading in a normal year. Um, so the idea that you can retain all of your staff and you're trading at those sorts of levels and you don't have any salary support whatsoever, I think is clearly um, mistaken. Uh, and, and therefore, I think the criticism that the industry has faced from government is also mistaken, to be honest. Thank you. John, anything that you'd like to add? Uh, no, honestly, obviously, we're, we're a global business and, and, and we do see problems uh, across Europe and into the United States, as I mentioned earlier. So it's, it's not a UK specific problem, but it, but it is worse in the UK. And, and Nigel's right, you know, we, we pleaded with the government to do something at the end of GRS and that, that fell on, on deaf ears. Um, and we're, we're unfortunately reaping the consequences because even though we're, we're starting to recruit people now, again, as Nigel said, uh, whilst people think just loading bags on and off is just a, a hump and dump job, it, it really isn't. It's quite skilled, and um, and it's quite a, a you know the the ballet of having you know what, what we do is not petrochemical engineering, but having the right people in the right place at the right time is quite is quite difficult because planes are supposed to take off and land at their as they are scheduled, but they they sometimes don't. And if a plane lands 20 minutes later than it's supposed to then your rostering is thrown off. So you have to have dynamic rostering systems and get the right people with the right skills. So, um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a global issue at the moment. Um, or, or sorry, I'd probably say it's a, it's a major hub issue at the moment. Um, but in the UK, it's definitely worse. Thank you, everybody. Tomorrow, I don't know if you're on, otherwise back to the chair. Are you, are you out there tomorrow? No, I'm here. I've been here. Right. Well, Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I think that last answer takes us very neatly onto your question. Thank you. So my question is, would the travel industry benefit from more relaxed immigration laws or do you expect shortages to be mitigated through domestic recruitment? I find it very interesting being half Turkish with the comments about um, Turkish immigration being potentially a solution, given the tone of some of the comments in the leadership campaign recently. I will go to John first, please. Um, yes, we, we need a relaxation in immigration, um, for, for sure. Um, I, I, I think we are facing a massive short term problem. Do I think this will be a problem in 2025, 26? Potentially no, if, if prices go up a bit, but um, we, we absolutely even then need a relaxation in immigration and the free freer movement of staff. We as a global business have the ability to move in people, especially managers and supervisors, to make things better, but we just can't do that. Um, so the UK therefore doesn't benefit from you know our ability to do that, and it's not just Menzies, uh, you know, Swissport, WFS, Donata. They're all in the same boat. We, we, we could make things better, but we can't. 
Thank you. Simon. Yeah, I think uh, it is a great disservice actually to the nation, not just the travellers, not just the airlines, not just the airports, not just the ground handlers. But if you look at the world's great successful hubs, and let's take, for example, Dubai or Doha um, as examples, all of their aviation staff are workers from overseas. I don't think I've ever met a, a single Emirati except in passport control at uh, Dubai. And given the global nature of aviation, the idea that you can bring in people and skills from abroad is one of the absolute essentials, I would say. And so therefore, um, the, the fact that we uh, uh, restrict uh, the labour pool so tightly um, is, I think, um, uh, from the point of view of aviation, uh, uh, deeply to be regretted. Thank you. Um, Luke, same question, please. Uh, yes, I think the answer clearly is that the industry as a whole would benefit from uh, clearer routes for uh, immigration to be able to fill critical roles across aviation and travel generally. Um, as I've said before, though, I think this is a two-way street, to be honest, and, and, and we also need the government to focus on labour mobility. Uh, and being able to get uh, people uh, more freely into the European Union as well. Um, and clearly there are benefits if you could create, you know, mobility agreements between the UK and EU in both directions. If you think about the domestic and inbound tourism markets, for example, they are very dependent on the language skills that they get from many EU citizens, uh, and they will be losing out um, from the inability to hire many of the staff that they rely on, uh, as well as the outbound travel industry suffering from not being able to move operations. I've also, yeah, I've also heard that with customer services uh, jobs as well, as you know, the loss of immigration means the loss of language skills, given, uh, yeah, I speak as someone who, who went to school in England, our infinite capacity at learning foreign languages. Um, thank you for that answer. Nigel, lastly to you before I defer to no. the... Um, thanks, Tamara. Yeah, no, that's a, that, that last point is uh, you may have you, it may have been a throwaway comment, but it's a really it's a really key one actually for us. Um, as for the reason Simon said, you know, it's, the Heathrow is a global hub. Half the people who use uh, the airport are not British. Um, a large portion of those don't speak English, um, and therefore not having people who can speak to them in their own language is a you know is an issue for us. Um, so, but see, so, yeah, the point that Simon summarised it really well. You know, it is a global industry. We definitely. Uh, suffer as a result of being able to access global global talent um so the large so you know the answer you know the answer to your question is um is yes um we anything that makes the labor pool larger is is you know is a benefit there are particular roles and it's interesting you know thinking about what's going on at Heathrow at the moment where many of john's colleagues in terms of the ground handling skill we are competing with each other um for the same pool. And there are certain roles at Heathrow, for example, actually working for Heathrow Airport and being a security officer, there are certain requirements. You have to have been a UK resident for three years for security reasons to be an actual security officer. Um, so that, so you know, you, the, the ways in which from a security officer, specifically for that role, that, that, that might not be a huge advantage. But at the moment though, what, what we are competing with John for for the put. So therefore, even if there's certain roles, certain roles where you where you know it wouldn't help particularly that big a role the having the overall pool being bigger um and then going to some specifics i mean it digital skills um such a shortage in the uk at the moment and so therefore the wage um inflation that's causing and the com the, the, the competition there are for those resources um that has been a real uh, when i spoke to, speak to my colleagues who work in it they have really noticed that being uh, a real short, you know, immediate almost consequence of the last couple of years that um, there is um, real competition for those kind of skills, um, which, you know, previously you would be able to go to a much wider pool of people to be able to accrue that kind of skill in. So very clear answer to your question. Yes, we would benefit from relaxed immigration laws. Tamara, sorry, can, can I just add as well, if, if you yeah. look at the, um, the shortage occupation list, you have um, web designers, I know. Architects, architects, welders, I know, um, and, and health service and public health managers and directors, which I probably support. But why would our industry not be included in that? Oh, I, I mean, you know, Deborah and I, we we wax lyrical about the the shortage occupation list and its need for expansion. And I I haven't actually. I I know from architects there is not a lack of architects in the UK. That's one thing we do skill very well. So it's a very interesting list. Um, and it's good to know that, that if I need something welded, it'll yes. be fine though. 
Yes, well, you can certainly have it designed by an architect. You just can't have it built um, or imported. Um, I, I would defer back to the, our lovely chair. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tamara. And I think there's also a bit of a STEM issue in there as well. Um, John, would you say, can I just come back to you in relation to your IT point? Are you saying that actually the, um, the pool from which you're recruiting just don't have the skills necessary? And that goes back to how we're educating our youngsters as well. Uh, I think that maybe Nigel that said the idea. Yeah, well, yeah, um, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, that's okay. I mean, John, sorry, but, but by all means, you say your views on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we 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 are trying to recruit. You know, again, as a global business, we 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 are headquartered in Edinburgh. We're we're trying to recruit call centre staff, and you know, the the, the costs have gone through the roof. Um, so so at IT. IT is the, the heartbeat of every business. And uh, yeah, costs have gone through the roof in that, in that area. And not just in you know, the, the, the highly paid areas, you know, call centre staff, um, that, that it's, 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 it's a problem, yeah. And can I just uh, take uh, your views, Nigel, on, on whether we're getting the, the right mix of skills coming through our education system? Yeah, that, uh, we're, we're, we're not. And the biggest gap I'd say is engineering. So we have a, a very, uh, important and talented engineering team at Heathrow, very extensive, um, and that is, uh, it's yeah, both in terms of its diversity, but also in terms of its number, it is it is not where we would like it to be, um, and that is yeah. So that STEM agenda is uh, is not being well served at the moment. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're on to our last question. Over to you, Hilary. Well, thanks very much indeed. It's been a really uh, interesting session. I mean, you've touched on a number of the the things I'm going to ask you about now. But if if say we were the sixth of September, the new prime minister was sitting on a call with the four of you, what would be the two or three things? And if you could be very brief, the two or three things that you would say to the government, this is what you need to do to help the industry. Starting with Simon. Um, there is an enormous amount of consumer detriment going on at the moment because of the labour shortage, because of the skills shortage, and that that uh, aviation absolutely desperately needs to be added to the list of uh, uh, industries for which um, relaxed rules need to apply. And that doesn't matter for whether it's the EU or anywhere else in the world. We just need people here to deliver the great service that we did until 2019 in the aviation industry. OK, well, that's very clear. Thank you, Luke. Uh, it probably won't surprise you to hear that from my side, it would be the government need to look again at labour mobility. I would note that Lord Frost himself uh, accepts that the government was perhaps too Puritan on this in his recent uh, Churchill speech. So, you know, I would say the government needs to look again at labour mobility between the UK and the EU. There are actually some things that could be done within the current kind of political realities. So we have proposed the extension of the youth mobility scheme, which already exists between the UK, Australia, New Zealand, several other countries to EU countries on a bilateral basis. You could do that now. It isn't part of the normal immigration channels. It doesn't give a right to remain longer term. We would like the government to engage with us about the benefits of doing that. And as I say, that's two-way benefit because you would be opening up language skills for workers to come and work in domestic and inbound tourism industries, not just benefiting UK outbound operators getting their staff to and across Europe. So yes, labour mobility would be the priority and then skills and recruitment and getting the government to engage with the industry on, on how we improve that area as well. Okay, thank you very much indeed. John? Uh, labour mobility and less red tape. Uh, the red tape is killing our industry. Um, Nigel touched on it. If we want to uh, employ a baggage handler before we can apply for an airside pass, we need to get a five-year employment check. At the moment, if you write to somebody and say, did Joe Bloggs work for you three and a half years ago and were they a nice chap, you don't get a reply. People are too busy. Um, we, we, need to, we need to change that. Our, our regulations are tougher than the rest of Europe, and I don't understand why. Okay, and finally, Nigel. So, thank you, Hilary. I'm trying to trying to limit myself to two or three. Okay, let's let's have a go. <laughs> um, right. So, I think there's there's a, the a big one that we just in the last question. You know, uh, we need uh, sustained talent pipelines through better skills and education, better joining up between them. And something I talk a lot to ministers about that there is just not enough dialogue between industry and educational establishments with under a government framework to mean that out of the pipeline of UK education system, 
other skills that British business needs. It's, that's would be probably uh, one. Uh, second one would be picking up what others said, yeah, labour mobility between the UK and Europe. Um, potentially, I mean, potentially extending this to other countries where we could accept um, quite a lot of time in, in aviation. The government I behind, well, not behind, that's sort of pejorative. They there are concerns around security and. John just talked about the fact that you know, the five years of referencing, it's used, it, it does create a, uh, you know, a barrier and I think it would be good to review, you know, are, yes, of course, we need security standards at the airport and mini vetting, but are they actually, you know, what they need to be? Do they actually really add the value or are they just administrative burden that just stops people who would otherwise, um, you know, have successful careers at Heathrow being able, be, be, being able to do that? Um, so I think I, I'd link on that. And then link to that then is, is the point that, um, that um, John was just referring to just then, which is the actual and specifically to require to get an airside an airside pass at a UK airport, you need to have provided um, five years of references, as, as John said. Uh, if you have, as you sh as, as everyone would have done, they've, they've uh, had a PAYE record with with customs during those five years, then already some or somewhere on the government system is their five years of of, of employment history. If someone issues, it gives us a um, a reference which refers to all the roles if we could find a way to just cross check that with that that's what hmrc records said they've done then there's no need for us to go through a process of contacting five years worth of employees and what we're finding now Hillary, with the way that things go is we're having people who've had 10 15 jobs in those five years um and that is you know once we tell them they've got to get those references they yeah, they don't come back for a second interview um so you know getting that okay. um, doing that streamlined would be helpful OK, that is extremely helpful. I mean, it sounds like it's it's a conversation with the Home Secretary in particular that is needed to deal with a number of points that you've all raised. Just very finally from me, is there a place where you, the industry collectively comes together and is it able to have these conversations with the government? Um, yeah, so yes, um, Department of Transport does chair a um, industry uh, that involves um, industry right. fora, that involves uh, colleagues from Whitehall. But let's say, how can I put this diplomatically? The engagement from some of the other Whitehall departments is not what we would want it to be. Does that include the Home Office? Is not what it does include the Home Office. Yeah, it does include the Home Office. Yeah, it does include the homeless are invited, but whether it's at the right level and the right level of engagement, because you, know, you can turn up to a meeting, Hillary, and you know, tick the box, but are you actually listening and engaging? That's the question. Okay. Hillary, to give you an example, it was sure. very difficult for ground handlers even to get on to some of these meetings that Nigel talks about, because it's all about airlines and, and, and airports. But then when I got on to, to represent the whole ground handling industry, I, I think there were what I would describe as six or seven real people in the industry but there were 49 people on that call, you know, and, and nobody, you know, so, so what the hell are all these people on the call doing? Um, and, and, and most of the outcomes were, yeah, let, let's have a committee to look into this. You know, we, we need decisions now. We need to take, you know, and, and um, to me, it should come through the aviation minister, then the aviation minister should take the, these things forward. Um, but it was a very, very frustrating process. And I, I think Nigel diplomatically um, gives the right answer there. Great. Well, that has been really helpful. Um, right, Deborah, back to you. Thank you very much. Um, an awful lot of what you've said sounds incredibly familiar to the music sector, particularly um, meetings with the relevant government department, but not getting proper engagement with the Home Office. We have definitely experienced that. Um, I would like to say a really big thank you to John, Nigel, Simon and Luke. It's been absolutely fascinating. I do really wonder whether we're going to be ready for the changes next year. Um, Simon, can we just touch with you just last minute? Are we ready for May 2023? Uh, in terms of um, ETIAS, most definitely not, but that's actually more to do with the um, uh, problems that, that you will find at uh, Dover and at Folkestone with the ferries than with aviation. Um, and of course, there will be uh, all kinds of confusion going along with this, which um, unfortunately uh, the media um, may not um, help with especially. So um, yeah, it's gonna be an interesting uh, few months, but first of all, we gotta get through this summer. But, okay, thank you all very much indeed. And uh, I'm sure we will be coming back to this is issue. We're now going to move on to music. Thank you all. Thank you.
how are we doing in terms of getting our witnesses all together? Somebody from the Trade Commission, can you tell us, are we, are we all ready to go? Yeah, we're all ready to go, thanks Deborah. Thanks very much indeed. I'm just not seeing at the moment uh, Stephen Maddock. Ah, oh, there we are. Good to see you, Stephen. Um, right, so we've heard about um, the challenges within travel, a lot of it centering around uh, mobility and huge shortages of staff. So we are now going to move on to a one hour session investigating what's happening in music. There are definite resonances across. Uh, so with us, uh, we have uh, Stephen Maddock, who is the chief executive of the CBSO, uh, Dave Webster from the MU, who is head of international there and knows everything there is to know about Carnes. Um, and Naomi McCarthy, who is from the ISM and is our senior policy officer uh, looking into all things Brexit. So a really strong panel today to get to what can be very technical issues within music, um, because music looks out directly across into EU. Um, and that's where all the problems are coming from. How do we get our music sector to work in the EU post the TCA. So I'm going to start with the first question, which is what has changed in the music sector since we left the EU? And what impacts have these changes had? So um, can I start with uh, Stephen? So what has changed since uh, we left the EU? and what have these impacts been? So over to you, Stephen. Thanks, Deborah. So I think three sort of basic headings um, uh, relevant to us as a touring orchestra. So just for, for anyone who's not familiar, CBSO 90 piece orchestra based in Birmingham, but we tour typically three or four times a year within Europe. And then we also tour occasionally beyond Europe. So we go to the United States this October and to Japan next June, but typically three or four European tours each year. Um, the demand for that is still there. We are still getting invitations and the sort of Brexit related workload um, is falls to us generally rather than to the European promoters. The three key areas are relating to visas, um, which the effect for us has simply been that we are simply not touring to those countries that have, uh, you know, made that made the route for working visas more onerous, which has meant initially Spain and Portugal, parts of Eastern Europe as well. Luckily for us, for our touring profile, the heartland of sort of Germany, Austria, Switzerland, France, Benelux, which takes most of our touring, did adopt a visa-free route um, uh, from, from the start. So that has been better for us than for some, but I know for those orchestras that relied a lot, for instance, on touring to Spain and Portugal, this has been much more difficult. And for individual artists, which I'm sure we'll come back to, there are other complications there. Secondly, there is the rules around needing a carne. So because we left the customs union, everything has to go in and out on a temporary export license, which is issued by the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, still, I think quite a lot of uncertainty as to exactly how that would work. Our first European tour post Brexit in November, um, our truck had to turn around from Dover. It was refused um, uh, access getting onto the ferry because the paperwork had been signed in a way that um, the customs officials there didn't like. So it had to, in the middle of the night, drive all the way back to Birmingham. I got out of bed at 4 a.m., signed a piece of paper, and it drove all the way back to Dover again, uh, and then was allowed onto the ferry. Um, uh, but essentially, that is an additional cost. It's, it's a lot of paperwork, and it's additional cost of between three and five thousand pounds for us. Um, uh, reflecting the fact, the, the, the value of the goods on, on, on the truck, which is, you know, usually several million pounds worth of instruments. The most onerous thing, however, is the cabotage rules, which basically is relates to the sort of protection of the road haulage industry within the single market and customs union, which means that by treating UK trucks as a third country, 
um, you can only make, it's slightly complicated again, but you can make essentially two stops in one country and one in another. Now, a typical European tour, such as the one that we did in March of this year, that took in 14 different concerts in 10 different cities in five different countries. And we would normally take our um, specially engineered brand new truck that we bought with an Arts Council Capital Grant a couple of years ago um, to uh, all of those places. It's a very specialist bit of haulage because the temperature and the humidity have to be controlled throughout and there have to be all the right places to store all the flight cases and so on. Um, we are now in the situation where that truck can only typically do the first two dates of any tour and perhaps the last one. We then have to rent uh, a vehicle. We're using a, a company in, uh, in Leipzig who do this for us. But the cost of that on that tour was about an additional £20,000. Um, and, you know, for most touring, which is at the margins economically, £20,000 is often the difference between, uh, as Mr. McCorber would put it, uh, success and misery. In other words, the thing that makes a tour uh, lose money rather than make money. Um, we'll, we'll perhaps come back to cabotage later, but th those are the three things. Can I just follow up on that point about the additional costs? Um, presumably, if that's uh, biting into your profit margin, you must be thinking seriously about whether you are going to be touring as much in the future. Yeah, so, so our board has a very clear rule on this, which is that as a um, salaried orchestra with high fixed costs, we can only tour when we make a surplus um, to help pay for that because our grant income nowhere near covers those fixed costs. We have to pay um, for our, uh, you know, I mean, I mean we, you know, everything we do has to make us money in order to pay for the, the difference between our fixed costs and our, and our grant income, which is relatively low by European standards. So basically, if a tour is going to lose us money, we can't do it. Now, you, 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 you know, that's assuming perfect information at the time you make the decision. So there's a bit of a lag on that. But yeah, absolutely, Deborah. There, there are now tours that we are looking at that in the past would have been profitable, which are now not profitable, which therefore we are having to decide you know, whether we can do this or not. And the answer will increasingly be not, particularly when you then start thinking about the sort of carbon impact and those choices that we're having to make and if carbon is priced in as well. Thank you very much, Stephen. Can I come to you, Dave? Can you uh, talk to us um, about the experience of the smaller bands, the rock and pop bands, the emerging bands? What's going on there? Thanks, Deborah, and thanks very much for the invite to to uh, speak on this. And I was listening to the airline industry, and it, you're absolutely right; those parallels were were really quite shocking. Um, what's changed for the smaller artists? Well, pretty much everything. Um, what was once an expense-free, paperwork-free pain-free ability to earn a living in what was once the UK's back garden is no longer the case. Um, from 2016, as you know, Deborah, you know, the music industry campaigned for visa-free travel for musicians, a musician's passport, um, that the spectre of carnets and musical instruments and equipment uh, would be a real issue for musicians, and we're now finding that it is. Uh, the loss of freedom of movement, massive impact, and the amount of paperwork this um, red tape that we were promised would all go uh is 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 enormous for musicians and and it's it's really difficult for the smaller um medium-sized artists more so perhaps than the larger artists who have got you know a large back office they've got large resources they know they're going to fill out a huge stadium uh, and they can weather the storm yes they've got increased costs and increased paperwork but they've got the resources to be able to deal with that. As Elton John has said, I will carry on touring, but it's the smaller, medium-sized artists that are really going to struggle when they're trying to do that for themselves. Um, the lack of clear and concise information for musicians to clearly understand has been something we've all been grappling with. And the uncertainty that musicians face is something the music, music, music industry has been working to try and overcome since the TCA came into effect. We were told we would be OK, and we definitely were not OK. The talent pipeline is massively under threat. So if you've got a small and medium sized artist who perhaps their music is better liked in a European country than it might be in, in the UK, in order for them to now to go and build that fan base, to earn that money, to sell their merchandise, they're going to have to go through so many hoops and pay out so, so much amount of money to be able to do so. 
um, that they're now going, well, it's not really viable. We can't make this work financially. So we can't rely on legacy artists for the rest of our lives. We have to be looking at the talent pipeline. There's loads of fantastic music out there and it's got to get over to Europe in order to be able to, to, to really survive. We can't just rely on the UK market. So there's huge uncertainty. There's member states interpreting the rules, how they choose, and we're, never, we're not necessarily going to know how a member state might interpret the rules from one day to another. And we've seen problems um, at Lille Eurostar where musicians have been fined. Uh, we've seen a problem at Brussels Eurostar where a musician perfectly legally, as far as we're concerned, took his portable musical instruments into Europe to play some gigs in, in Germany, had his uh, violin taken from him. He was allowed to carry on with his banjo and his guitar, but his violin had to go. And we, we, we got stuck in, we took it to the government. The government really didn't do a lot on this. I got stuck in and we spoke to Brussels um, uh, Customs and we made, and the, the musician got his instrument back. But nevertheless, the impact of that potentially is huge because what if he hadn't been able to do the gig? What if he hadn't been able to fulfill the contract? It's nonsense. So those are just, you know, I could talk for hours on this, but we, we don't have the time. But those are some of the, the real impacts uh, that are affecting the small and medium sized artists and individual artists. Uh, thank there's, you, there's no, benefit. there's no benefit to us leaving. Either. No, no. I'm not going to come to Naomi because um, the problem with this issue when we get into it is we can literally all talk about this for hours, as Dave has just said. So I'm going to go directly across to Charles with the next question. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I've, my question is about how how do the new visa requirements, uh, which came into force as a result of Brexit, impact on the willingness of performers and their teams to come to the UK? Um, I was partic made particularly sensitive to this uh, a few weeks ago at the Wigmore Hall, where a concert had to be completely changed simply because a soloist uh, had, hadn't been able to navigate these visa requirements. And uh, I think uh, I'd like to point that to uh, Naomi to start with, please. Thank you, Charles, and morning, everyone. Hope you can all hear me okay. Um, yeah, so um, the, the ISM actually published a report in April 2020 um, entitled How Open is the UK for the Music Business, which looks at, at all, all these issues. Um, so just, just to give a, a, a quick summary, so um, taking EU performers to start off with, they, they actually count as non-visa nationals. They don't need a visa if they're working for less than 90 days and 180 if they're coming to the UK. Um, sounds good, but actually it's not as simple in practice because they still need paperwork and they still need to get it stamped when coming in. Um, so just to give a, a very quick overview, because it's quite complicated, if you're coming in for up to 30 days, there's a route called Permitted Paid Engagements, PPE, um, that requires a letter of invitation from a UK-based venue, uh, festival organisation, it requires proof of professional status that relates to that engagement in the UK, and proof of onward travel after 30 days. Um, if you're coming in for longer, there's the Tier 5 Temporary Worker um, route, that requires a certificate of sponsorship, a COS. Um, which uh, incurs a fee um, of about £259, I believe. Um, and there's also another option if you're performing at one of the bigger festivals. These are permit-free festivals, so you can come in for up to six months for those. Um, so the, the impact of this has been quite severe. So there's been a lot of, for PP, there's been a lot of confusion about what, what document documentation is actually necessary for this. Um, it causes problems if you're coming in with crew or entourage, they're not eligible for the PPE routes, they would need to do something else. Um, at least 30% Zara research um, of applicants for PPE can expect a refusal or bad handle handling, that means it's delayed so you end up having to cancel your concert. Um, and also it seems a risky route simply because you have to vouch for yourself. Um, unlike the COS where it's, it's a sponsor um, and the visa office is seen as, as uh, putting more weight on the, the role of the sponsor. Uh, so you're more likely to get rejected basically if you're coming in on PPE. Um, but even the, the certificate of sponsorship is not actually that straightforward because it's really designed for salaried jobs and not for touring freelance musicians um, and they, you know, because they're not actually direct employees of the sponsor. So that creates complications too. Um, and something else that needs to be mentioned is that neither of these two routes is valid for multiple visits. Now, lots of musicians will come in several times a year, um, but you have to go through the same process every single time at the moment. Um, 
and you have to remember to get it stamped. I think there's quite a lot of musicians that are coming in forgetting that they can't just go through the green channel. Um, so that's storing up potential problems for later too. Um, and one other thing we've been uh, made aware of is that uh, carnets and CITES, obviously the, these now apply to uh, orchestras and other musicians coming in. And we had a story about the Czech Philharmonic um, where they brought in a bunch of CITES uh, items, which uh, they require musical instrument certificates. They'd done all the correct paperwork, but they were told wrongly at Heathrow that they needed a carnet for their hand carried CITES items, not true. And they also needed export licenses for the higher value items, not true. Um, and they are understandably very nervous about coming back um, as a result if they're going to have all these uh, issues again. Um, uh, taking it more widely to, to people at the visa nationals that actually have to get visas, you've probably all seen in the press the huge, huge delays that have been going on with this. Um, it's been taking six to eight weeks to get a visa. Um, it should be two to three. And uh, many people coming in for the summer festivals are risking not being able to come if they can't get their visa. Um, and last, just point I want to make, there's a perception of home office hostility, I think understandably so, which means that people are actually more reluctant to apply in the first place for, for visas to come in. So, uh, thank you very much, Naomi. That was very comprehensive. Oh. Uh, I wonder if I could pass the question straight over to, uh, to Stephen. Yes, I mean, I think uh, Naomi's covered the, the main points. I mean, I think there's been a very short term issue recently to do with just capacity at um, border agency to deal with uh, to deal with requests. I know that um, because of because of the large number of of, of um, requests coming from from Ukraine. So I know there have been musicians who have not been able to get their visas agreed in time in what would normally have been a sensible time window. We, I'd say we, we have not had that issue, but I've heard it from across the classical sector. I think um, more generally thinking in terms of the, the, the immigration system, um, I think uh, uh, you know, so so we, we've talked there about you know temporary temporary performance, which generally means conductors and soloists and people who are paid quite a lot of money to come and perform and stay in the UK for perhaps a few days at a time. In terms of recruitment to orchestras, um, there's a real difference here between the salaried orchestras like mine in Birmingham, where we offer a full time salary that is above the threshold in the new point space system which means essentially we can recruit musicians from anywhere in the world, which we could not previously do, thus making immigration easier. This is not, I suspect, the Brexit that people were voting for, but it's an interesting irony. But the difference is with the freelance orchestras and much of the classical music profession is made up of freelancers, in particular the four main London uh, self-governing orchestras, the LSO and the Philharmonia and LPO and RPO, they don't offer salaries. So actually that route is not really viable for them and certainly people who um come and freelance with lots of different groups in london and move, maybe move from gig to gig the the salary threshold is is essentially for a single employer um so i think that has made it much much more difficult for freelancers coming but actually for for, for salaried musicians uh, ironically it's slightly easier than we had expected and it means i can now for instance employ musicians from japan or china or australia uh, if they meet the standard i mean it's very competitive getting a job in one of our orchestras anyway but um uh, this 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 ironically is easier it's probably the one thing that's easier thank, thank you Stephen. i wasn't even expecting one thing to be easier from this session <laughs> nor was uh, i uh, but but can we can, can we can we pass this uh, this on today Thanks. Well, I don't have a great deal more to add. I mean, Naomi's summary of the situation was uh, very comprehensive. Um, so, yeah, those are, the, those are the problems. And obviously for freelance musicians coming and doing one-off gigs here and there for orchestras uh, or freelance bands, scratch bands, as we call them, uh, that's, um, yeah, that's problematic as, as has been set out. I think it's worth noting, I don't know whether you've seen this morning, it just came across my desk. Just going back the other way into Europe for a moment, if we may, uh, but the um, the Independent has reported that uh, UK artists being booked for EU festivals over the summer has dropped by 45%. And that's just hit the news this morning. I haven't read the full article yet. Thank, th thank you. Thank you, Dave. I think, well, I think we've heard here how a precarious profession has become quite perilous for many. Uh, and with that, I'd like to uh, pass it over to the chair. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, I think we've actually examined quite a lot about the incoming routes. So I'd like to go back to the outgoing routes. So the challenges that musicians face on the mobility side. So government has repeatedly said 
uh, that they have spoken to 24 countries and that it doesn't look that bad to them uh, in relation to musicians going from the UK out into the EU to tour. Um, Naomi, can I come to you first? Can you just explain to us, because it is very complicated, the difference between visas, work permits and the patchwork that is the EU, because it's not it's not standard, is it? And I think that's really important. And I know this is horrendous, but if you could just give us an overview of what the typical musician is up against, should they think they're going to go and tour in the EU? Yes, yes, of course. And, and yeah, the, the government has said several times, oh, you know, it's it's fine, you can go, you can go and there's visa-free touring is allowed in, was it 27 out of, 22 out of 27 EU countries, but it is much, much more complicated than that. So um, so, so visas are, um, and, and work permits apply, I mean, the, the EU member states can set their own rules. Um, quite a few of them do match the UK's current offer of, of 90 days, up to 90 days in a period of 180. Um, so Germany, France, Italy, um, and uh, yes, uh, some others as well. Um, but quite a lot of them also, about half of them don't actually match that offer. There's quite a lot that only offer up to 30 days touring until you need a permit or, or a visa. Um, um, and there are there are quite a lot of other, other um, uh, paperwork issues that, that you, you need to sort out as well. That so for example, um, Denmark has a has a rule that you have to be an artist of a certain status to be able to, to, to take advantage of the visa waiver. Um, and we found some of our members have been affected by this. You might be a, say, a solo pianist that's going over, but they go, nope, you can't have a visa because you don't count as a kind of essential member of a, an important artistic event. Um, or say the Netherlands, uh, which uh, it kind of looks all right uh, uh, on, on the face of it, but actually there's a, there's a salary um, threshold that you have to be, you know, or the earning and, uh, uh, capacity you need to be uh, over that threshold to be able to get the, the, the necessary waivers. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a much more complicated picture than, than you, you might think. Um, actually, Cyprus and Malta don't offer any exemptions whatsoever. So even if you're just going for one day, um, you need to have a visa and work permit for those places. And the places like Austria, um, it's actually only a, a few days that, that, uh, that, that you can, you can uh, work for before you start needing paperwork. Um, so yeah, just a very quick summary there, because it is, it's just hugely complicated. And as a musician, you need to understand those rules before you travel. Uh, and I think the government messaging has actually been very unhelpful with this, suggesting that it's actually okay in most of them, um, because you, you do need to check first and make sure that you're not going to um, fall foul of any um, uh, import uh, regulations, yeah. And uh, Naomi, can you just help us with what has been happening to UK musicians? who wanted to go for an audition, say, in a, an EU ensemble, or were actually already working in an EU ensemble? What has been their experience? Um, well, we, we've had some, some stories of people actually having their work cancelled um, due, due to the complications. So I think there was a, a leader of a Baroque um, European orchestra um, who they just said, I'm really sorry, it's just too complicated and we're going to have to um, not to hire you for the next season. And she lost that entire season's work um, purely because, yeah, the, it was just too complicated. Um, and we've seen, um, we've, we've actually done five um, Brexit reports, as, as you know, um, what we've seen, the picture coming out through through those reports has been that um, uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, audition um, notifications or, you know, adverts for, for work or for auditions, um, they actually now will say for EU citizens only, um, which obviously debars our our musicians unless they have dual citizenship. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Dave, what's been the experience of the MU in terms of your members trying to get across to work in the EU from the um, visa and work permit perspective? We're getting a mixed, a mixed bag. Um, it's taking an awful lot of preparation and time in order to make it happen. Some tours are beginning to happen and, and if they're doing the right preparation and they're spending enough time doing it, then things you know, there is work, they are doing it, uh, but it, it is it is um, faced with a lot of problems. And I think we've, we've got a bigger problem looming, which was referred to earlier on, which is the ETS um, coming in in May 2023, whereby this 90 and 180 days rule is going to massively impact. Um, and I was going to talk about that a bit later uh, uh, under another question on supply chains. Um, but yeah, we, we're getting a mixed bag 
of reports of issues that have, have cropped up from individual musicians. But I did have a, an email this morning saying from one band that they took all the advice and they did everything right. And they went into France and they did some gigs and they came back and they, they, they were OK. But I had another I had other reports of, of things not being OK, as I referred to earlier on. So we're gra gradually getting case studies. I think one of the interesting um, takes from government is that they constantly asking us for case studies. Well, touring has only really started to take an off, take off since the beginning of maybe this year and certainly towards the summer months. So we're not really getting as yet a fully comprehensive picture. We've given government everything we've got, and I know the ISM have done the same. And they seem to be considering that as, oh, well, you know, um, things seem to be happening. But it's just not not the end of the story by by any means. And I think as ETIAS comes in, as people start to bump up against their 90 days, especially when it also applies to holiday time and things like that, we're going to see further problems down the line. So, um, yeah, the, you know, it's it's really, really patchy. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to move on to the next question, which is with Jeff. Thank you very much, Chair. Good morning, everyone, again. Um, given the fact that a lot of this is about sector conversations, I'd be really interested to hear what our guests think about the consultation processes to develop post-Brexit policy within their sector. You know. Did it happen? In what form did it happen? And I'd appreciate you didn't say it just wasn't good enough. Could we expand a wee bit on that? Could we start with Stephen, please? That'd be great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, I think, look, I think there was a lot of conversation during 2019 and 2020, certainly with the Association of British Orchestras. So our, that's our trade body. They have built up a great deal of expertise in these various technical matters relating to, to Brexit. Uh, and they certainly made recommendations, and some of which we've already heard relating to sort of touring passports and so on. That said, it was a massive surprise to them when they read the TCA on the 2nd of January, or whatever it was, uh, last year, that uh, the, the, the issue around cabotage. So that had not been consulted on at all. And I think it goes to the heart of, you know, Obviously, it was a very complicated agreement to negotiate. We know all about those things, but it had simply not occurred to the to the to the government officials doing the um, negotiations that the haulage would be an issue. Um, so that was that was the re the really really big surprise. I think since then there has been a certain amount of goodwill, a recognition, um, including you know from you know including from the the the, the, the sort of more ultra brexity side of um of some of these debates that that things haven't quite gone according to plan and what can they do to help. um but i think that the the as, as dave has already said the part of the problem here is the rules and added on top of that is the fact that nobody understands the rules so the sheer complexity even for government. So we get different answers from government, from different government agencies, depending on who we ask about certain aspects of things. And the ABO and the ISM and other trade bodies of the MU have done their best to pull together sort of practical guides to this is what you need to do. And if you are an institution like mine that has, you know, staff and, and you know, professional admin, okay, we, we just put more people on it. So it's costing me more time, energy, people, all of that. I've got a lot more people working on touring. If you're an individual trying to um, work your way through the morass of rules and red tape, it, it is very, very defeating and depressing. And I know that that is having a sort of, um, you know, a, a, a reduction on actual activity because I, I attended a meeting of the Arts Council, Arts Council England's um, touring, international touring group um, a few weeks ago. And there were about 50 people around the table, including visual art, including uh, um, subsidized theater, as well as commercial theater. So a real wide range of institutions I was in, orchestra represented. Um, and actually, almost everybody around the table was saying, we're now doing much less, or indeed, we're now doing nothing at all. Uh, and, you know, added to the cabotage costs on, on, on haulage was obviously the, 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 the energy costs and you know, petrol costs and diesel. Um, but I was really surprised and shocked by the extent to which 
companies had simply stopped thinking internationally at all because it was too much like hard work. Well, not too much like hard work. That's that's unfair because it was too complicated for them to be able to navigate safely, and because the costs involved simply made projects not um where i was actually one of the few people in the room say well look it's harder stephen thank you very much i i think we just missed the last sentence uh the technology happily drifted in and out um, do uh, you want to have one more go at that please i i'm sorry sorry yeah uh, no all i was going to say was i was surprised that we were pretty much the only people around the table at this Arts Council meeting who were still doing, you know, a significant amount of international touring, both in, within the EU and beyond, because to most companies, it seemed, and there were some quite large companies representing large West End producers, they were simply saying that the combination of the rules and the complexity of understanding them was, was making um, touring just not viable, too much risk and too much cost. And this included, you know, to issues to do with touring theater where particularly you know you, you're not just taking one truck as we are you might be taking several trucks worth of a set um uh, and technicians uh and some quite large companies who were simply saying well we're not going to tour that into europe now anymore so it definitely is reducing the amount of trade in in in, in the cultural sector more generally thank you very much naomi can i just pick that up and also just go back to the question about information if i may um what i've taken from what i've just heard is the fact that there's lots of questions and lots of answers neither of which are clear or consistent is that what you've heard so far yeah i think that very much mirrors what we've uh, experienced at the ism as well and well, there has been consultation I and mean, we find we've been to many many meetings of the touring touring working group um that meets with the department of culture media and sport we've also met with the cabinet office um we've met with the um dft we've met with defra uh, and they you know they often they, they, they nod and they listen they they they, they seem concerned and and they say yes yes we know we know you know we understand um but then nothing really actually happens. Um, I, th I think it, 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 and, and in some cases they have tried. So the, the DFT came up with the, the, the solution of dual registration to try and overcome the problems of cabotage. And it's been heralded as, you know, it's going to keep people on the road this summer. Well, it doesn't work for orchestras who uh, have a single single track and they, they can't actually take advantage of that really. Even an orchestra that actually has a member in Ireland and actually has land in Ireland and technically could establish a base there. And it's we're just it's just too complicated for us to do this. So the solution they've come up with hasn't really worked, sadly. Um, and uh, others they didn't have given up with. So Carne, as we've said many, many times, please could you come up with a solution uh, for, for traveling musicians? Um, and the answer we now get is, well, you know, just it's a fact of life. You have to get to Carnes if you're going outside the EU. So, you know, just deal with it. Um, and uh, yeah, very similar. I mean, uh, musical instrument certificates for CITES as well. We, we've been consistently saying, please, 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 can you keep these free? Because it would, if you introduce a charge, as they're thinking about doing next year, um, then it's going to add to the burden on, uh, on musicians, uh, which they really could do without. And it just seems incredibly likely that they're going to introduce them because they, as they, as they say, it's the only one, it's the only bit of document from CITES that you don't really get free. So, you know, that's just inconsistent. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, we're fully expecting that there's going to be a, a fee for those. So, yeah, so consultation, but not much outcome, really. Thank you very much. Dave, you've had loads of information and just enough to depress you by the sound of things. Do you want to pick that one up, please? Well, I mean, it's, as Naomi and Stephen have said, it, it, it's all exactly right. But there's one other thing, that, in, you know, in this, that in the last, what, 18 months, two years since we've been in this, we've had four different secretaries of state to DCMS. Mm -hmm. And every time we get a new one, we have to start at point one again because, you know, they don't get the briefing or whatever. They don't understand. So we have to explain the situation yet again. And we're going to have to probably do that. Uh, again, I mean, prior to Brexit, we have very little information um, about how we'd be impacted. We discovered then that there was a no deal uh, Brexit and the industry galvanised itself and lobbied to get the government's attention. And as, as Naomi says, yes, we're now talking to HMRC, Bays, DFT, Home Office, Cabinet Office. All of them say different things in different ways. All of them say it in a term, in a set of terminology that is really difficult to understand. And we've been pleading with them to try and issue some sector specific guidance which they refused to do 
one of the key things that we do need, um, and this is backed up in a report that came out yesterday, is, a, is an information hub as part of a sort of transitional support package, which is so important for us. I mean, the music industry worth, what, 5.8 billion uh, before uh, we hit the pandemic. Um, music industry was worth what? Uh, so fishing industry was worth one point something billion, and yet they got 23 million pounds worth of of, of funding and finance to help them through and we've got absolutely nothing so far so a transition support package is what's needed but speaking to these government departments pleading with them for uh help and assistance which with there's name is said they're reluctant to kind of give um you know we have got a few policy changes through the the the, the dual easement but that as i say only helps five big hauliers who can afford to have dual bases in, in the EU and the UK, doesn't help the orchestras with own account, and it doesn't help the smaller, um, again, going back to the smaller, medium-sized artists who might use a haulage company with one or two trucks. That doesn't help them at all. So, you know, we're still in a, in a semi-solution to the problem uh, that, that, that we need. So, yeah, we are getting some positive noises about an information hub, but um, there's a long way to go. And we're not there yet. Yes. Thank, thank you very much. Back to you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, uh, over to Tamara. And uh, I think you're going to be uh, picking up the issues around supply chains. Yeah, I, thank, thank you, Deborah. I've actually got two, two questions to ask. So the first question is, what do you feel are the knock-on effects, is the knock-on impact to other sectors in supply chains of changes to the music industry? post Brexit. Now I speak to you as someone who worked as a stylist for over 20 years and therefore uh, possibly has my own thoughts on this too because obviously it impacts on the people who work around the musician. Um, and I will start with you please Stephen. So I think um, for, for, for us, um, you know, if, if we get to the point where we're doing less work internationally and therefore less work, then that means we are not hiring freelance musicians, we are not hiring music publishers, we're not hiring artists which affect artist agency. We were very conscious during the early phase of the pandemic that actually, although the government support came to institutions and employers, it was not freelance talent. Mm -hmm. And we argue right from the start was the best way in which we can support that freelance talent is get back to work straight away. So we were the first orchestra back doing live concerts, one of the first orchestras back doing um, uh, digital uh, activity as well. So I think, I think you know, less less trade, less international work means less work for freelancers. I think um, perhaps they'd be better place to discuss this with the rock and pop, but I know that what t tended to happen with big rock and pop shows, particularly with American artists, is they would come to the UK, do their first concerts here with a UK crew, and then take that UK crew yeah. all around Europe with them. Yeah. And they no longer doing that because the crew can't travel so that work is being picked up by crew either from ireland or from mainland europe so yeah. that's a whole load of freelance very specialists like as you say like stylists as well but sound yeah. engineers lighting uh hauliers stage you know all of those specialist skills that are simply um you know not getting the work and and frankly as a result having seen this coming have left the industry so there's or a big yeah, or what happens is the people who are really well known will get the work because they might be picked. They might be so important to that artist, but the people yeah. coming up the type, the talent pipeline, yeah. are not going to get the breaks because they won't have built their reputation already. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. that's true. Yeah, um, Dave, I think you clearly have got some points on this. So over to uh, you. Well, yeah, I think one of the biggest problems again around crew and support staff is it, that that look after the big tours, and I think the theatre industry is really going to be impacted by this. Mm. Is the ninety and one eighty day provision? So it's not it's not a blanket across the twenty seven member states. There are various different uh, rules, as Naomi talked about earlier on. But once ETS comes in, that's really going to impact. So when you've got crews, when you've got session musicians who are supporting featured artists who make a career from going one tour to another to another to another along with all those crews. And, you know, I've spoken to, you know, if you speak to the um, PSA and you speak to people like Craig Stanley at Live, British crews are renowned across the world as being one of the best. And if they're not being picked up by the artist, then there's a clear knock on effect. In terms of, yeah, so doing those tours, you, you very quickly run out of your 91 in 180 day provision, in which case you've got to come back to the UK. So who's going to pick up that work? Well, that's going to get picked up by European crews. So there's a market failure there as far as the UK is concerned. 
uh, in terms of the smaller artists and their merchandise, one of the, you know, what they're now faced with is import duty, sales mm -hmm. duty, VAT and all that kind of thing, and very problematic. They've got to fill in all kinds of either a simple declaration if they've got merchandise and baggage or a full uh, declaration if they go over those limits. And those limits are helpful to a certain extent, but then you've got the rules of origin that are impacted. So if a T-shirt is made in in India, but it's overprinted in the UK, that still doesn't mean it's a UK T-shirt. Yeah. T-shirt. So the VAT. So what's the workaround? Well, you get your uh, merchandise in the country in which you're going to be working in. So again, there's a supply chain failure back in the UK because mm. of that. Um, and it's just really complicated. So, so those are the few points I'd, I'd, I'd put on there. We've talked about the, the cabotage issues. Um, again, as Stephen al al alluded to, and we, we know this, that um, the truck gets parked up, the British truck gets parked up somewhere and sits in a car park doing nothing, costing money to have it sitting there. And yet the work is being done by EU hauliers, specialist hauliers in the EU. So again, supply chain issues there. So it's not going to affect, it's not just me. And, and also, industries. And also merch was, his, uh, you know, with the loss of record sales for, that was a way that a lot of bands were making their money. Yeah. So impacts on that, impacts on their, on, on what their, on what their profit is, which would it also then impact on the team capacity that they can have. Yeah. And as I understand it, there's very little vinyl production now in the UK. No. Well. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask that question to Naomi before I go to my next question. Sure. Yeah. Or just, just, just to add, I think that we're already seeing the knock-on effects of the UK haulage industry, as um, Stephen and, and David alluded to. Um, so there was an estimated 85% of EU touring companies were operating out of the UK before Brexit happened. Um, and we're now hearing reports from Live UK that uh, actually the major uh, UK event hauliers have now opened depots in the EU to take advantage of the dual registration um, workaround, and they've split their fleets. Um, and the impact is that there are actually now not enough UK-based hauliers um, to service the UK market at, say, peak festival time. So it's an immediate knock-on effect we're already seeing. Um, and I think, as Dave and Steve, Stephen has already said, there's this just technical ecosystem around musicians. It's all the sound, lighting, stage engineers, the promoters, they're all affected by any decline that we see in the music industry. Um, and I just wanted to mention the wider impact as well. So we we uh, we heard recently from um, uh, a European orchestra which used to, to do some of its rehearsals in, in the UK, and it's now decided not, not to do that because it's uh, just too complicated for it to do that. But it, they were pointing out that the knock-on effect on hospitality and travel, um, uh, the, you know, the, the hotels and the restaurants that they would be using, the airlines, the train operators are just not doing that now. So, you know, there's much much wider ripples that, that, uh, that happen from, you know, one orchestra not not coming over completely there are all the there it is it is a ripple effect isn't it if 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 a talent doesn't come to a, a town um you know the impacts on that on on the, that community that support that artist are massive and 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 i think that leads very neatly to my next question speaking into that because it's around reputation um what do you feel the impact of post-Brexit changes has been to the UK status as a cultural capital? I mean, I have a lot to say on this, but I'm going to direct that question to Stephen, please. Yeah, I mean, so so I suppose my general point here would be I don't think there's ever been a time where Britain has needed its friends as much as it needs them now. And actually, um, cultural uh, cultural products touring uh, whether that is, you know, hit West End shows, whether that is fabulous British orchestras, whether that is dance companies, whoever it is, um, we are an important part of soft power. We work with embassies overseas. We work with business support groups. We, you know, as an orchestra that carries the name of a major British city in its title, was set up by that city's council 102 years ago. We have been very very conscious of our social kind of civic role right from the start mm. and you know in the next 18 months we have concerts in you know almost every major uh, city in, in 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 the world um including you know washington and new york and tokyo and paris and and amsterdam and so on so um we we, we want to be able to do that there is definitely a risk that we will be doing less of it there is already as i've seen from other organizations a lot less of it happening and actually that I think just continue, you know, just contributes to rendering the UK more invisible. Um, you know, if, if our other, we know other trade sectors, uh, you know, particularly manufacturing have been already hit 
very, very hard. Um, uh, less trade means less influence, means less visibility, which is bad for inward investment. I mean, you know, speaking from the city centre in Birmingham here, which is about to host the Commonwealth Games and is been a permanent building site for about the last 10 years, have massive overseas direct investment. The people here are really, really worried about that, really worried about whether the um, whether, whether the European uh, and, and indeed further afield investment is still going to happen in the same way. So they are definitely looking to those of us who can work internationally to help spread the right message, uh, which we which we are trying to do. But it's, it's it, it all becomes harder because of these restrictions. Thank you. I'd like to also ask Dave that question because I think I think it I think it hint, hints at a wider issue around. Uh, I actually think it's power, not just soft power. It's actual power because we make a lot of money in, across the creative industries for the UK economy. It's something I don't think has been reflected in the policy support that we've received. Um, yeah, completely Dave, I wonder that. what your thoughts are. Well, I completely agree with that uh, uh, statement, Tamara. Yeah, you're right. It, it, it is power. We do produce world-class music we do produce world-class theatres and orchestras and i was talking to um somebody from salt uk theatre and they're very concerned now that the big touring productions that have always come out of the uk because people want to see direct from the west end mm -hmm. that's now under threat and people may get direct from broadway mm. or direct from a us tour or direct from japan yeah. Uh, so that's a, that's a big threat and a big loss to, to again to our industry. So it, it is it is about power. Um, soft power gets talked about a lot. Uh, there is no other way of putting it. If we don't nurture our industry and if we don't support our industry out into the wider world, certainly into our back garden, as I talked about earlier, which was such a such a you know a close and very huge market. Mm -hmm so much easier to get into than the US or, or to fly mm -hmm. over to Australia. Mm -hmm. It's right on our doorstep. So if we don't reinstate some of those, um, that ability to be able to perform uh, just across the water, then, then we really are looking at uh, a massive diminution, both financially to the UK government and the UK government responds to economic arguments. So I don't understand why when we keep, keep saying, look, the creative industries, what was it, 111 billion was the figure? 16. 116. 116. Music <laughs> industry alone, 5.8 pre pre COVID. I think it's come down a bit since COVID. But nevertheless, it's a huge, huge part of the uh, UK identity. And, and we're going to lose it if we, and that talent pipeline. Uh, issue if we, we can't rely on legacy artists going forward so no I think that's the really key point I, I take away from what you're saying is the reliance on legacy and also therefore the reliance on people who've built their reputations when obviously the borders were open uh, you know over the last 20 years I think that's that's the key isn't it because yeah, yeah. as we who have established our careers age then what happens to the people who come after us hmm. it's already difficult to start um, you know especially if you're freelance so how do you map that out if it if there's no support for you um uh, yeah that's right yeah, yeah. i mean I'm, I'm hearing a lot of the same the same issues that are facing the fashion and the fashion industry um you know a lot of the same things that's why i work very closely with deborah outside of the commission identifying these issues because she's done great work on on pushing this forward but i also want to pick up i also think what's been really important from what i've taken away from this is that different departments of government agencies are set potentially saying diff saying different answers and therefore there's not a uniform solution. I, I took that as a key takeaway from another question. Um, but thank you very much for your responses. I'm going to hand back to the chair. Thank you very much, uh, Tamara. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. We're, we're getting lots of different bits of the jigsaw puzzle, but nothing ever happens, which is very, very frustrating when the creative industries is worth the same amount as construction or financial services. It makes no economic sense. So um, we are actually a little bit ahead of time. Um, so I'm going to go over to Charles now. Uh, thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, I think I may take up the time because I think I've got a very big question coming here. <laughs> But we've seen, uh, we've heard, we've heard a lot. I think of very grim news through this session, uh, in what should be a really celebratory industry. But uh, 
so the question is, what must the government urgently prioritise in order to mitigate the issues facing the music industry? Um, I'm afraid we've only got 11 minutes, <laughs> but uh, please, uh, over to you, Stephen. So um, three things, I think, uh, some of which are harder than others. Um, I think there needs to be a solution for uh, the cabotage uh, issue. Now, we've been told that, that can't happen before the TCA has opened up again five years uh, after it was signed. But I, I, I really would urge the government to explore whether there can be some form of cultural exemption made. It's quite hard to get the right definitions, but the, there are cultural exemptions in also other areas, such as VAT. Um, and I, I would have thought there is a way of making some kind of cultural exemption which recognises that a UK orchestra or band travelling into the EU for the purpose of performing and then bringing that cargo back is different from an exporter taking stuff abroad to sell. So cabotage number one. Number two, I think, is around the, this sort of we, we this clarity point and we really would appreciate people getting their shit together you know it is so confusing it is so misleading um whether that whether uh, you know whether within dcms or whether it maybe it is department for international trade but somewhere there needs to be a one-stop shop of information that if you're involved in cultural um exports you can go to and get the right answers without being passed from pillar to post that is something the government ought to be able to do on the purely financial front, my final point is, is um, it, the mitigating factor for us this year, next year, on all of this has been the temporary increase in the creative sector tax reliefs. So the, these reliefs which were introduced uh, about a decade ago initially for film and TV, then were extended to theatre and then in 2016 were extended to orchestras. That has been a vital lifeline for the CBSO because our local authority grant income has reduced by over a million pounds a year in that period. But the, the creative sector tax reliefs, which essentially say, instead of a grant which says, you get this money for your overheads, whether or not you do any work, what the tax reliefs do is say, we will give you a effectively negative income tax, a ne sorry, negative corporation tax, the more work you do. So it encourages growth and activity, which therefore encourages organizations to employ freelancers and uh, make work. Now that, that does operate overseas. So for us, that has been really helpful. In last year's budget, those rates were doubled on a temporary basis. And on April 23, they are due to go down again to something nearer their original rates. And on April 24, they are due to go back to their original rate. The single thing that Treasury could do that would make the biggest difference for producing theater, opera, ballet, and orchestras would be to extend the higher rate of uh, the tax reliefs. Well, th thank you very much. Um, can, I, can I ask you, Dave, to take this, this question on? Yeah, uh, thanks, Charles. Um, well, it's a timely question. Uh, in the week when the All Party Parliamentary Group for Music released their Let the Music Move report, uh, which is really good. Uh, I don't know when you can see that. It's it's no, it's sorry, it's getting in the way. Anyway, if you've not read it, do. It's really worth. It. In that are a list of seven recommendations uh, as to what needs to be fixed, and these are common sense recommendations to government. And ultimately, what we really need to do, and I think we we should really be focusing on, is re-establishing good relationships with the EU because we're going to need them going forward. Um, and this is being hampered by the issues around the Northern Ireland Protocol at the moment. Mm. We need to drive the message that the cultural exemption, as Stephen said, and everybody I've talked to in the industry has said the same words, cultural exemption uh, to the TCA uh, is needed if the creative industries in the UK are going to survive long term. Um, I know the ISM contributed to Let the Music Move, the MU did as well, uh, and we support all of those recommendations some of which can be implemented by the UK government straight away. For example, the transitional support package. They could get on board with that. The information hub, uh, clearly reliable um, and accountable set of information supported by government that is understandable by the music industry is something that can happen as a priority. And we don't need to involve anybody else with that. We, we, can, we can do that internally. Um, other areas require, uh, require EU engagement, but what we need is the political will 
from the UK government to take this on run with it and fix it. Maybe, given the current state of the government, some changes may bring in a new approach. Um, and the opportunity to bring about provision in the TCA for a cultural exemption is upon us in sort of 2025 or 2026, when it can be renegotiated, and we may have a new government by then. Um, so the APPG report has wide music industry support, and the government needs to embrace those recommendations and make them happen. Um, and we'll do what we can, obviously, to, to support that. It's been mentioned earlier, but Lord Frost admitted to the government, in fact, to the world, that the government had taken a too purist view. Well, that needs to get rectified. Uh, thank, thank you. I think that's pretty clear. But uh, uh, could I ask you, Naomi, to, to bring this, this session to a, a, a close uh, with, with this question as to you know, what should government do? Um, uh, something has to be done, but please tell us what. No, absolutely. Uh, well, I mean, uh, I think um, uh, Dave and, uh, and Stephen have covered a, a lot of the major issues here, but something that the uh, ISM has been advocating for since uh, early 2021 is a visa waiver agreement. Um, and I think something a very similar idea has come out of the uh, the recent report from the Music APPG as well. Um, and this is actually something that would, would be possible. I'd like to mention the Partnership Council here. Um, that I know the government is very reluctant to go back to and reopen the TCA, but the Partnership Council, Council actually exists to be able to, to resolve issues that have arisen in, in the first few years of the TCA coming into effect. It's a mechanism that we could use and I think should use um for this uh, especially if there are emissions i mean it, it's clear that the, the government didn't realize quite the damage that the tca was going to do to the music industry this is a clear area where they need to go back and say look it's not working can, can we talk about resolving it um and we believe that a visa, a visa waiver agreement is would be uh, uh, the way to do this you could actually make it include cabotage as well same reason why you couldn't fold those two areas into one um and the idea of it was it would, be, it would resolve a lot of the complication um by bringing all eu states into line so they all offer the same 90, 90 days uh, up to 90 days work in a period of 180 it would solve a huge area of red tape um, uh, and actually there's plenty of uh, precedents for this already. Um, since 2009, the EU's actually entered into 28 agreements with other countries um, for visa waivers for particular sectors. Um, the, the government's arguments against it seem to be mainly political. We had a meeting with them last September, along with our QC, Sarah Lee, who's done, has advised us uh, on, on uh, whether a visa waiver would be, would be practical. Um, and it kind of came out in that meeting that, that, that it, it was really political reasons why they didn't want to, to go back to the EU on this. Um, and that seems to come down to control of our borders and then feeling that if they you know, sort of open the door here, then it would mean we couldn't control our own borders. Um, but uh, but our advice uh, from Sarah Lee QC is very much it would be completely viable to have a visa waiver uh, agreement. It wouldn't actually necessarily even involve reopening the TCA. It could actually be a, a short supplementing agreement that you could put alongside it. Um, it wouldn't threaten the freedom of movement because it would it would it would be quite strictly controlled to ad hoc performances by creative professionals. Um, and I think a wider point to make here is that touring isn't immigration. I'm not sure we've, we've said this in the session, but it just isn't in a typical tour by an orchestra or a band or an individual. You know, you will stay one night, maybe a couple of nights in one place. You move on, you repeat that and then you go home. It's not immigration. So an agreement that would allow that to happen, you know, it, it just doesn't threaten our borders in, in any way. Um, uh, and so the ISM, yeah, we, we would love to see a visa waiver agreement negotiated. I mean, we think that, that would, that's really the kind of first priority, particularly for a new regime in, in Downing Street. Well, thank you very, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to hand back to the chair to to close the session. Thanks very much, Charles, and thank you very much, uh, Dave, Nemi, and Stephen. Um, I, I always try and uh, because it is such a technical area. Think about this as a number of buckets. So I've got my three bucket analysis. Some stuff can be done by the UK government. Some stuff can be done between the UK government and nation states, and some stuff can only be done between the UK and the EU. And what we have here at the moment with the big issues like visa waiver agreement and cabotage is a reluctance on the part of our government to actually pick up the phone and talk to the EU and use that partnership council. And that's, in my view, what we need to be encouraging them to do. So I would like, again, just to thank 
Dave, Stephen and Naomi for their brilliant, incisive analysis and all of uh, the commissioners on the line today. Thank you all very much indeed. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.